And Acts, Matthew, and Hebrews are just like Romans, every song of Solomon. And uh, I'll try to take you through it, but before we go through it, I want to start right now at the beginning and tell you this. There are going to be times in here when I'm just going to have to just read the verse to you and then pack on the next verse, or just read the verse and let you all talk, because I won't have any idea what it means. And uh, like old Sam Jones said, he said, if I understood all the Bible, I knew somebody who wrote it didn't have more sense than I do. And a lot of the Bible I don't understand. I don't understand First John, about half of it. I don't understand the Zechariah, about three-quarters of it. And I don't understand the Song of Solomon, about uh, nine-tenths of it. And uh, there's some pastors in uh, Obadiah and uh, Habakkuk and Zephaniah and Micah that I have a rough time with. So don't ever think for a minute, and people think this once in a while. Well, you don't think, well, you know, he thinks he knows it all and knows all the answers and got all the answers. I got all the answers, see, right here. I just don't know them all. See, but I got them. I got them right here. And, uh, but I don't know them. And I'd be, I'd be uh, deceiving you folks if I said that I could teach this book uh, properly uh, because I can't. I'll do what I can with it. But you're going to find this book many times. You're going to find me running off the spiritual application because that's the only way to get out of a... <laughs> A thing you just can't get out of. I mean, the things in here that if anybody ever worked them out, I don't know who it. I don't know who it was. I've read uh, John Peter Lyons' commentary, twenty-two volumes. Pope's commentary, twenty-two volumes. James Foss Brown, one volume. Dumelo, one volume. Clark, uh, five volumes. And uh, Matthew Henry, five volumes. And then all the Bullinger's Bible with a uh, hundred and sixty appendices in it. And uh, if anybody's ever found out what the thing, I never read anybody found out what it was. Uh, if you get, if the Lord shows you something from the book that'll help the class, I'd appreciate you injecting it because I'm just going to kind of slide through. We might as well teach, I guess. We've taught Proverbs and Psalms and Job in the last seven years, and uh, that's all the, the wisdom books for the one, so we might as well go ahead. All right, Psalm of Solomon. Song of Solomon. This book here has uh, eight chapters in it. It has eight chapters. It has 117 verses. It has 2,661 words. And the, the word Solomon occurs in it seven times. The Song of Solomon. And in the Bishop's Bible, written back before the King James, says it's the ballet of ballets. The dance of dancers. And some people doubt that Solomon wrote it. And most people think he did write it, but they got all kinds of ways of interpreting it. The ways of interpreting the Bible are the mystical way, the political way, the Augustinian system, and uh, the devotional system. Luther's uh, interpretation of the Song of Solomon was mystical doctrinal. That is, Luther taught that uh, the doctrines of Christianity are contained in the Song of Solomon in a mysterious form that uh, the Old Testament saint couldn't understand. Uh, Basil and Theodore, that's Eastern Church fathers out of Greece around the time of Christostom, uh, they teach the mystical spiritual view of the book. They teach the book is not Christian doctrine, but spiritual lesson in a, in a mysterious form. Origin and Eusebius, uh, two gentlemen from church history, they teach that it's a, a profane uh, form. They teach that uh, it's a song of Solomon with two girlfriends, and one of them is a, is a shepherd, Des, and one of them is a queen. And he's playing them both against each other and talking about them in the story. You know, it's a love story about the infernal triangle. And they take that view of it. So you know what to think of that. And then there's the Catholic view of it, uh, which makes it erotic and mystical. And they're teaching the Song of Solomon as a picture of the Bride of Christ. But the Bride of Christ is Mary for some peculiar reason, which I've never been able to quite figure out. So they all have trouble with it, <laughs> and uh, I, I probably had as much trouble as anybody. All right, Song of Solomon, chapter 1. Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 1, the Song of Songs. Now, that's not the one that Russ Colombo sang, that Ben Crosby copied, that Perry Como sang before Dean Martin picked it up. They have kind of a Catholic apostolic succession in Dirty Singers, you know, it runs that way. You know, <laughs> comes a uh, Columbo, you know, and then the, the next Catholic picks it up Crosby, and the next one is, it wasn't uh, 
No. Como Rider was another fellow in there. I can't think of his name. But he's like that, you know, all alike. All alike. And then you get uh, Martin Hall of gets the next one up. And, uh, like in that line, kind of succession. Now, that's how many ever heard that song or song? See your hand? You never heard the song or song? You never heard the song or song? Oh, man, you missed the song or song. <laughs> that's a popular song. It was. It came up about 1930. It went through 1940 and 1950, but they played some of the old ones over at the time. I'm sure they're still playing it somewhere. I'm certain. I heard. I was, went out to eat breakfast this morning. Somebody put a nickel in the jukebox, something over there, and they're playing Flamingo. Well, Flamingo was 1943 in the Dorsey's Orchestra. They're running 20, 25 years backward. So I know they have a song or song somewhere. Well, if you ever get a chance to hear it, turn it off. It ain't worth hearing. <laughs> Uh, one, the Song of Songs, which is Solomon. It's not Columbo's or Bing Crosby's. The Song of Songs, which is Solomon. Well, it must be some song, because Solomon wrote 1,005 songs. Uh, I don't have a reference mark for that, but uh, that's what he wrote. <clears throat> Anybody got it? It'll be in, in Second Chronicles or First Kings. First Kings what? That'll be about it. <clears throat> uh, 1 Kings 4.32, yeah, that's it. Uh, 1 Kings 4.32, and he spake 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. That's uh, quite a record. Uh, Handel, uh, he wrote 118 symphonies, 163 pieces for baritone, 15 masses, 5 oratorios, 42 German and Italian songs, 365 English songs, and a total... Well, the Brett here, the total group of his works was 1,536. And Solomon here wrote 1,005. I put him up near a handle somewhere. And then this is called the Song of Song. So that's, a, that's the best song of, a, of 1,005. The Song of Song, which is Solomon's. Then it begins. Let him kiss me with the kisses of the mouth, for thy love is better than wine. Well, it's plainly a woman speaking. Let me kiss, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine. Now, the number of methods of interpretation, but the one that's usually held by nearly all the commentators, is the reference to the bride of Christ. And the reason why is that Solomon is obviously a type of Jesus Christ. Now, that's pretty clear. Uh, Jesus Christ is called the son of David. Well, Solomon is the son of David. And the sure mercies promised to David in Psalm 89 were promised to his son, and that the New Testament promised of eternal security. I know Solomon has a Gentile bride, and Christ has a Gentile bride. Solomon is king of the Jews, Christ king of the Jews. Solomon could answer any question put to him, so can Christ. Solomon got back all the land, promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Christ will get it when he comes again. A Gentile queen comes to see Solomon, the queen of Sheba, type of Gentile in the millennium. So Solomon is obviously a type of Christ. Now, of course, he's type of Antichrist, the paragraph mark in the King James, so you want to observe the paragraph mark. He goes from Christ to Antichrist for 666 in Second Chronicles 9, 13. But he's a type of Christ. All right, as a type of Christ, then, if there's any woman connected with him as a bride or a wife, she'd have to be the church. And... Uh, it's pretty good. It's pretty good interpretation. I'll show you why. Uh, look at chapter two and look at verse uh, ten. My beloved spake and said to me, "Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away." It's a reference on the rapture. Look at verse eight. The voice of my beloved. Verse ten. Rise up, come away. Somebody said, "Well, it's the tribulation rider." No, it won't work because this love here is a singular one. Look at. Song of Solomon 6, 8, and notice this bride of Solomon is one particular individual, unique bride, separate from all others. Song of Solomon 6, 8, there are three score queens, four score concubines, virgins without number, Matthew 25, Revelation 14, my dove, my undefiled, is but one. She is the only one of her mother. She is the choice one of her that bore. Well... Uh, David, uh, Paul says in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, he said, uh, 
I have espoused you as a chaste virgin to Christ. One. One. The Bible says there is one body. You can't make that tribulation of saints. You can't make an Old Testament saint. All right, Song of Solomon 1, 2. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, but I love is better than wine. Then in tight, it pictures the love relationship between the body of Christ and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, even the unconverted in the millennium are told to kiss the son, lest he be angry and ye perish in the way. That woman that wiped his feet to uh, kiss him, wiped his feet with her hair. And kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine. Well, a kiss is a sure token of reconciliation in the world. They consider it to be that. Uh, you've got all kinds of kisses. You've got, uh, you've got a, a filial kiss, a devotional kiss, like uh, father and child, mother and child, relations in the family. You've got an unholy kiss. You've got like Samson and Delilah. You've got a, a hypocritical kiss, like Judas kissing Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, and uh, Joab kissing Abner before he cut him open through the middle. And then you've got a holy kiss. The Bible says, greet the brethren with a holy kiss in Thessalonians and Timothy. But generally, if it's uh, proper, it's considered reconciliation. It's considered things are all right. Uh, two, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. By love, speaking of Christ, is better than wine. Well, a Christian don't have to fool with wine. Uh, the Lord's love is better than wine. Oh. Uh, there's a passage over, we'll turn to it, back in Proverbs. It speaks about wine for a certain type of person. And yet in this uh, passage, it's plain that wine is not for kings. And God hath made us to be kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth with him, Revelation 5, 10. Proverbs 31, verse 4. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink. Verse 6. Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish. Are you ready to perish? Well, you shouldn't be ready to perish. You sound like to perish. You're not ready to perish if you're God's child. If you're God's child, God so loved the world, he gave him a begotten son, that whoso believeth on him should not perish. You don't have to fool with wine. Fellow said, all well, right for a Christian to drink wine. Well, if it was, it wouldn't be worth your time to fool with it. Fellow said, well, the Bible says, all right, drink a little wine. Yeah, but if you're in love with Christ, you don't need it. So he says, Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 2, for thy love is better than wine. Then... We'll close here. Because of the savor of thy good ointments. That's the smell of thy good ointments. That's perfume. That's like the woman breaking the alabaster box and putting the ointment on him. Because of the savor of thy good ointment, thy name is as ointment poured forth. The Bible says a uh, uh, good name is to be chosen other than what? Riches and back. Well, I, that's what I thought of. Oh, it had something to do with precious. Here it is, seven one. Or please ask you seven one. A good name is better than precious ointment. A good name is better than precious ointment. So here's a woman that uh, has a bad name. She takes the alabaster box. She breaks it. She puts it on Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, wherever she, if the gospel is spoken, that should be spoken to her in a memorial. She got a good name, and she got a good name from helping him out. And she got a good name from helping him out, and it cost her to him out. But a good name that she got is better than precious ointment that she poured out, you see. All right, three, because of the savor of thy good ointments, thy name is ointment poured forth. Therefore do the virgins, plural, write down Matthew 25 and, I, and Revelation 14. That's your tribulation saints. Therefore do the virgins love thee. The new translation by Moffat says, all the girls are in love with you. <laughs> what a reading, brother. You know, they say that's modern English. Well, brother, it's sure is degrading. Look at the difference between uh, because of the savor of thy good ointments, thy name is ointment poured forth, therefore do the virgins love thee, and because of the smell of the perfume, your name is worth a lot of money, therefore all the girls are in love with you. I mean, what a degrading Bible, you know. That's, that's Moffat. That's Moffat. And that reading, of course, doesn't uh, give the sense to text anyway. Is anybody with any sense? Well, no. All right. Uh, Therefore do the virgins love thee. Matthew 25 and Revelation 14. Is my clock slow? Well, good not. I'm ten minutes slow. I thought I heard a noise back here like they're ready. I didn't mean to keep you over time. But I'm, uh, I got ten minutes still. All right. We'll close there.
Well, let's turn to Song of Solomon, chapter 1. Song of Solomon, chapter 1. Now, before we get into this thing, I, this morning, I thought I'd read you something from all the brethren. Uh, this uh, little volume here is a, a fellow called Bunge. It runs 1,900 pages, which just about make two Bibles. And this fellow here, he's a, now he's a real, uh, he's a real scholar. He's like Kills. He's not in the scholars' union <clears throat> because he's premillennial. And uh, this fellow here is the fellow that uh, that uh, Henry Gruby, old Mobile, gets all his teaching from, and Cornelius Stram gets all his teaching from, and uh, J. C. O'Hare got all his teaching from. And these fellows, you don't, often, you don't often hear about them. The, the devil has a way of, of fixing stuff, you know, so you can't. Uh, you can't trace it. Uh, everything that Dr. DeHaan and, and Philo Epps and uh, Charlie Fuller got, they got from Clarence Larkin. And the devil has a way so the men really do the work. They don't get known. They're, they get hit under the shuffle. And this fellow here is a, he's the author of uh, everything that couldn't, everything that couldn't stand never got a hold of. They got a hold out of here. And uh, this thing here is so voluminous and lengthy and heavy that uh, I don't recommend it to anybody. I mean, it's... Uh, if you want to burn your eyes out and spend the rest of your life, you know, in a book, why well, you can get something out of it. But uh, he has some notes here in the Song of Solomon I thought you might like to hear. Um, this is by a Jew, Gibberg, 1857. And since the Song of Solomon is an Old Testament book written by Jews, it might be interesting to see what an Orthodox Jew thinks about it. And this is the statement of what an Orthodox Jew says about the Song of Solomon. Now, Father, we pray my best to here today and bless the preaching service. And we ask the Lord to save. If anybody's son to save, it comes our way this day. And we pray that nobody will come to this building and leave without hearing the plain gospel and uh, the Holy Spirit and making the word quick and alive and revealing it to the heart. Uh, bless us now. We're assembling together. We'll study your word. Give us understanding. All the reading, all before thee, this is a hard book and hard to get a hold of. And uh, we lack understanding in it. We ask thee to give us wisdom and understanding in all things. And you said, if any man lacked wisdom, let him ask. God would give. So we ask thee for wisdom at this time. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> now, according to Ginsburg, and he's the father of Prince of Orthodox, uh, Jacob ben Chai, an Old Testament text, which are Orthodox Hebrew texts, he says this. Uh, there was a family living at Shulam, consisting of a widowed mother, several sons, one daughter, who maintained themselves by farming and pasturage. The brothers were particularly fond of their sister and took her under their special care, promising her prudence and virtue should be greatly rewarded. Chapter 8. In the course of time, while tending the flock, and according to the custom of the shepherds, resorting at noon beneath a tree for shelter against the sun, she met with a graceful shepherd youth to whom she afterward became engaged. Chapter 1, Chapter 6. One morning in the spring, this youth invited her to accompany him into the field, but the brothers, overhearing the invitation and anxious for the reputation of their sister, sent her to take care of the vineyard. Chapter 2. The damsel, however, consoled her beloved and herself, assurance that those separated bodily, indissoluble ties subsisted between them, over which her brothers had no control. Chapter 2. She requested to meet her shepherd lover in the evening, and as he did not come, she feared that some accident had befallen him on the way and went in search of him. Chapter 3. And found him. The evening now was the only time which they could enjoy each other's company, as during the day the dam was occupied in the vineyards. On one occasion, when entering the garden, she accidentally came in the presence of King Solomon, chapter 6, who happened to be in a summer visit to that neighborhood, chapter 6. Struck with the beauty of the dam's the king conducted her into his royal tent, chapter 1, and there, assisted by his court ladies, chapter 1, endeavored with alluring flatteries and promises to gain her affections, but without effect. Released from the king's presence, the devil sought an interview with her beloved shepherd, chapter 2. The king, however, took her with him to his capital in great pomp in the hope of dazzling her with his splendor, chapter 3, but neither did this prevail, for while even there she told her beloved shepherd who had followed her to the capital and obtained an interview with her, she was anxious to quit the gaudy scene of the king for her own home. The shepherd on her in this praise her constancy, chapter 4, and such a manifestation of their mutual attachment took place that the court ladies were greatly affected by it. Chapter 6. 
The king, as the commonest possible to win her affections, watched for another favorable opportunity, and with flatteries and offers of money, surpassing all he had used before, tried to obtain his purpose. He promised to elevate her to the highest rank, to raise her above all his concubines and queens, if she would comply with his wishes, but faithful to her engagement, she refused all his overtures on the plea that her affections were pledged to another, seven and eight. The king, convinced at last he could not possibly prevail, was obliged to dismiss her, and the shepherdess in company with a beloved shepherd returned to her native place, chapter eight. On the way home, chapter eight, they visited the tree under which they had first met, and they renewed their vows of fidelity with each other. On arrival and safety at home, her brother was according to their promise for her weekly for her virtuous conduct, chapter eight. Now, that's what it's supposed to be, according to Orthodox Jew. And, of course, so that stands. That's uh, it's simply a story, you see. And, of course, there are beautiful things in it. It's a love story. And um, uh, maybe, historically, that's what it means. But when you try to get the doctrine of that thing, boy, you've got some problems. Because King Solomon is a type of Jesus Christ. Well, he doesn't win the lady. She goes back to her shepherd lover, but who's the shepherd? Well, it's Jesus Christ. Now, see, it's really, really complicated. Now, the working thing is trying to make some application. You can't make any application. You can make the king antichrist. Tell you, you can do. You can make the you can make the woman of the song of Solomon the bride of Christ, and you can make the king the antichrist, trying to win her affections and her not paying any attention to him, um, sticking with the shepherd and making the shepherd Jesus Christ. So you can do that. But, uh, boy, we'll get some passages here in a minute that will sure mess up that interpretation. Because uh, King Solomon is one of the greatest of Christ in the Bible, and relationship between him and the uh, bride of this uh, Song of Solomon a little bit too close for an engagement. And so it's pretty hard to, pretty hard to put him down. Now, you can do this. You could say that this book, as in the marriage relationship, uh, is a is a perfect picture, a perfect rule of a perfect relationship between a man and a wife. You could say that, and you could say historically that that story I read you out of Gimberg is a nice story and it fits the passage. You can say that, and uh, you'll see that. Man. You can say this. You can say there's some beautiful spiritual truths in here taught about the relationship between the bride of Christ and Christ. You can say that. But beyond that, you're going to have problems. All right, Psalm of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 2. <clears throat> she's speaking. And according to Ginsburg, she's speaking about uh, the shepherd. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine commented on the last time. Because of the savor of thy good ointments, thy name is as ointment poured forth. Therefore do the virgins love thee. Won't fit. Won't fit the shepherd. Might fit the king. The king mm -hmm. has virgin and concubines without number. According to uh, chapter uh, chapter 6 verse 8 chapter 6 verse 8 there are three score queens and four or country balloons and virgin without, virgins without number. And Solomon had a thousand wives. Uh, might be a reference to the shepherd, but, but in the story it doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't sound right. Because the seed of thy good numbers, well, the name is ointment poured forth. I'll make it Jesus Christ. That'll fit. Because the seed of thy good ointments, like what Mary put over him, thy name, Jesus, is as ointment poured forth. That'll match. In front of words, Jesus is, uh, had to be broken that his name would come off and put out the savor's bit. Uh, Jesus' name was like ointment that's been in a bottle and that had to be busted before it could get out and fill the room. Draw me, she says. We will after thee. And in the Gindenberg interpretation, if the girl praying for the shepherd lover to come and get her, and uh, then she says the king has brought me into his chambers, uh, which means, in the, according to the first story, the king has taken this uh, young lady and brought her to the palace and tried to give her presents and gifts and everything and win her affections. But then she says, we will be glad and rejoice in thee, referring to her real lover. We will remember thy love more than wine, the upright love of thee. 
Well, I don't know. We'll make it Christ. Draw me. All right, if you're unsaved or the prayer you ought to pray, draw me. Well, John says no man can come to the Father unless uh, the Father draws him. Now, that means to pull like a magnet. Uh, Job chapter, uh, John chapter 6, verse 44 says, No man can come to me except the Father which have sent me, draw him, and I will raise him up last day. That's the force of a magnet that uh, pulls or draws. And the idea is you can't come to Christ unless the Holy Spirit draws you to Christ. Well, if you don't, fellow said, well, I'm not one of the elect. The Holy Spirit has never drawn me. Well, you ought to pray it. You ought to go home and get down on your knees and say, Now, Lord, I can't come to you unless the Father draw me. So draw me. There's no excuse for not being elected. Anybody can be elected. Tell us I'm about one of the elect. Well, that's ridiculous. Anybody can get elected. Just ask the Father to draw you. Well, that's what she says. Draw me. That's the pull. Uh, we will run after thee. We. I don't know what that's a reference to. You make it uh, the bride of Christ. Why, well, it means everybody's free. We will run after thee, Father Christ, the King. I'll make it clear. The King has brought me into his chambers. Well, that'll work on the rapture. Well, that draw me will work on the rapture. When Jesus Christ comes and pulls you up like a magnet, you go up and you go into the chambers. And you go into the wedding chambers when you go. Turn to Psalm 44. You go into the chambers for marriage. Uh, Psalm 45. Psalm 45, verse, uh, verse 1. My heart is writing a good matter. Turn the thing over. I speak of things which I have made, touching the king, like Solomon with Solomon. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. It says, my tongue, I'm speaking, is like a man writing down stuff on paper. Then he says, thou art fairer than the children of men. Grace is poured to thy lips. Therefore, God hath blessed thee forever. And then coming on down, and speaking of Jesus, verse 6, Jesus, verse 7. Then verse 8, All thy government but the smell of myrrh, aloes, case you out of the ivory palaces, whereby we made thee glad as the ointment. King's daughters were among thy honorable women, but on my right hand did stand the queen and gold of old Greer. And that's the getting ready for the marriage. Verse 13, the king's daughter is all glorious within, her clothing is of wrought gold. She shall be brought unto the king, as going into the chamber, in raiment of needlework. The virgins were companions, as she says, they will right love thee, and the virgins love thee. The, the virgins are companions, but follow her shall be brought unto thee, as the drawing. With gladness and rejoicing shall they be brought under life. They shall enter into the king's palace. And she said, The king has brought me into his chambers. So I take for granted the story that the king is the Lord Jesus Christ. I also take for granted the story that the shepherd is the Lord Jesus Christ. And somebody says, Well, how can he be both of them? Well, the answer is, uh, in this age here, he's like a shepherd. And when you get up there, he's like a king. As far as this world is concerned, he's not a king. Well, as far as the world is concerned, Jesus looks like some rustic shepherd out in the hillside with a little old flock someplace. He's a king in disguise. But someday he takes off the disguise and he's revealed, then he's a king. Isn't that how all those television shows do? I mean, there are only 33 plots, folks, and all in the Bible. There's many television show you ever saw. The plot is all over the King James Bible. And I've seen that plot a hundred times, you know, with the gay caballero, you know, and the, the prince's son, and the duke, and the king uh, is disguised as a burger or a common lackey or something, you know, and he's going around here and meets this beautiful girl, and they can't marry because he's a commoner, you know, and poor blood, and... He can't marry her because of something like she's royalty, you know, and all the time he's royalty. Haven't you ever seen one of those? About one out of ten come through that word. And they have all kinds of... It's always a plot, you know. The boss of the old corral is out there as a dude and a, and a cow puncher, you know, and then he turns out to be the big boss. You've got to follow the Bible. He's going to make a living. 
And only 33 plots in, the, in, in the television, radio, newspapers, magazines, all in the Bible. And so I took for granted that the disguised shepherd is the king. I'll make them both the same. Of course, I could be wrong, maybe Ginsburg right. But uh, Ginsburg sure has some problems here in a minute. All right, one, uh, one, four. Draw me, we will run after thee. The king is brought into his chambers. We. Well, uh, uh, whoever this woman is, she's a plural. We will be glad and rejoice in thee. We. And yet she said in verse 2, Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. But down in verse 4, we. It looks like it's uh, everybody to say. It might be one woman as far as the bride goes, but as far as people go, it's a bunch of them. We will be glad and rejoice in thee. We will remember thy love more than wine. All right, verse 2. His love is better than wine. Verse 4, his memory is better than wine. We will remember thy love more than wine. In front of worship for a chronic alcoholic, if you take a fellow on that's a chronic alcoholic, uh, you get him to fall in love with Jesus Christ, and he'll forget his liquor. And uh, that's the cure for chronic alcoholism, really. It isn't the AA. I mean, the AA gets you off for a while, you know, on and off and on and off. And uh, the AA, you take the, the AA, they can get you off, but they can't get you to quit wanting it. That fellow's going down the AA. I think the AA is a good thing sometimes. I, I recommend it to some people. And I have a counsel of couples where the woman had a man that just on that bottle, on that bottle, and can't break it, and can't break it, and can't break it. I tell them to go down there and join the AA, among other things. And, of course, you have some other things. But the AA, the AA you, you, know what the, you know what the CIA AA is, don't you? That's Alcoholics Anonymous. The CIA AA. Think about that a while. And uh, so they go down and join that thing, and the AA, you, don't you, you understand that, don't you? Well, the CIA, nobody knows who they are, do they? Well, they're anonymous. The CIA, AA, is Alcoholics Anonymous. It's a kind of a thing, you know. And uh, so, anyway, <laughs> they go down there and they can get off that liquor, but, and they can quit it, and maybe some of them can quit it for years, but they can't quit like it. And, you know, it's one thing to quit it, and it's another thing to quit it and enjoy quitting it. And, uh... Well, I'll give you a word of testimony. I never was what's called alcoholic, I don't guess. I mean, I never drank more than two cans a day. <laughs> and, uh, of course, in 10 or 15 years, you know, that can kind of mount up. And if I hadn't got to say when I did, well, I'd probably been maybe a couple of cases a day. But at any rate, when I was 27 years old, I found the Lord Jesus my Savior, and I had no trouble quitting the liquor at all. I mean, it just stopped. It just went along right to the 14th of March at 10 o'clock in the morning, and <laughs> that was it. And uh, I'm not interested in it. And you say, well, how do you overcome it? Well, you get something better. You get something better. And he says, remember, we will remember thy love more than wine. Do you know what a fellow remembers when he gets drunk or after he's drunk? I'll show you. Uh, uh, Proverbs 23. Proverbs 23, verse 29. I'll show you how drunk thinks. It's all in the Bible. It's all in the Bible. You don't have to buy any books. It's all in the Bible. Proverbs 23, verse 29. And he says, well, Remember, I love more than wine. A fellow, after he's been in a drunk, he goes back and tries to conjure up what he did. And remember it. And think about it. That's all they talk about. Do you ever hear fellows, you know, on the Naval Air Station and in the Army and Navy, you know, Oh, boy, we had one last night. Man, we pitched one last night. Boy, we pitched one last week. Boy, I last New Year's. Whoo, boy, you remember that last? Yeah, you know, they all vomited, you know, they all got sick and fell in the bathtub and everything. And uh, they, they, you know, they, they sit around and talk about, oh, how it was, you know. Oh, well, here's how it was. Proverbs 23, 29. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contention? Who has, who has babbling? Drunks that babble, they can't talk quick. You know, tongue gets thick. Right, 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 put them away, you know. <laughs> they babble. Who has wounds without cause? They go around and bump into things. I've, I've talked to many men who came in next morning, blood all over them. He couldn't tell you where he got it from. I've seen the mission with blood all over them, dried blood, the scabs all over them, the head to the foot. They don't know whether a mad dog bit them or they bumped into a picket fence or fell off the curb. They don't know what happened to them. And he said, Who hath wounds without cause? 
And wounds without cause means uh, most drunks get in fights and no cause for getting in a fight. And at the same time, you shouldn't fight when you're drunk. If you ever get drunk, go to bed, but don't fight. Because <laughs> these men are whipping the world, the drunk man. His, his reflexes don't work. And they show this fellow, you know, these, these, you know, the old drunk comes swaggering in. I can take only ten men in this place. A drunk can't. He can't take on two of them. And uh, so they go out there and they get in fights, and then they get wounds without cause. There's no cause for it. Who have wounds without cause? Who have redness of eyes? Answer. They that tarry long at the wine. They that go to seek mixed wine. So the Song of Solomon the Bride says, His love is better than wine, and his memory is better than wine. 31. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last, here's your memory, at the last it bites like a serpent and stings like an adder. That's your memory. You look back on the bite of a serpent, at the last, by an eye shall old strange women. That'll be your memory. And by the heart shall utter perverse things. That'll be your memory. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, like a man floating on the water, like this. On the waves, see, just, he says, tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine, unstable as water. See, you like that. And then he says, or as he that lieth upon the top of the mast, well, that's a crow's nest in a mast. That mast goes up, and that crow's nest sits up here. That old boy sits up there, and in a storm at sea, that old ship's going like this. And you know, it's bad enough to be down on, down on deck in a good storm, where the deck's rolling, and you're going, mm, you see, and, mm, but, and that's where a drunk walks. Walks like a man on a, on a deck in a, in a storm. But think about being up there, see, uh, 60 to 70 feet above. And that thing going, and that old ship going, and then, in a, in a sailboat, every time this fellow down here reels four feet, that old boy up there is moving 40 feet. And he says, that's the way the drunk is. Mine going like that. 35, here's what you'll remember. you say, they have stricken me, got in a fist fight, got beat up. They've stricken me, and I wasn't sick. So it didn't, didn't, get, didn't bother me. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. You get all tanked up and half stoned, you can't feel it. That's why they get in fights, I guess. Drunk get in a fight, he can't feel, feel it when he's getting hit. But I don't keep him from getting hit. Don't get him, keep him from getting knocked out. And I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. See that? The fellow says, when I get up, I'll go back and get me some more liquor. All right, Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 4. I will remember thy law more than wine. And uh, that means that when you think about what the Lord did for you and his love for you, it's the memory of that is better than wine. And it is. It is. Oh, my goodness, it is. It is any comparison. Uh, if, I, if I made an effort right now to stand here and conjure up all the associations I had on wine and beer and whiskey and gin and vodka and scotch and aquavel and all that and rifle boiler, if I had to stand here and think back over that, what was connected with that, and then stand here and think back over what was connected with uh, Calvary and my salvation, that book, brother, you talk about a comparison. They just, they, you couldn't, they don't even go in the same bracket. And so she says, we'll remember his love more than wine. Amen. We remember thy love more than wine. Now, that isn't all. We remember thy love, not the ointment. The ointment was good. Three, good ointment, and not the chambers. The king hath brought me into his chambers. Uh, the idea is, uh, the main thing is the king love. That's the main thing. It isn't the chambers. It's all the stuff that goes with it. Uh, we remember thy love more than wine. Then this note, the upright love thee. I don't believe that's a shepherd desk talking about a shepherd. Uh, that's the bride talking about the king. The upright love thee. And uh, the down wrongs don't. The upright love thee. Uh, if a man is upright, he'll wind up saved. Now, by that I mean, I mean an unsaved fellow. If, he's, if his heart 
is right. Now, we know he's depraved and all that. But I mean, if, his, if he seeks, if he's an honest fellow and is trying to find the answers, he'll wind up saved. He'll find Christ. I'll turn to Proverbs chapter 1 and pick up Proverbs chapter, no, it's Proverbs chapter 8. I'm not sure what I mean. Proverbs uh, chapter 8, verse, uh, Proverbs chapter 8, verse 35. Now, we know everybody's depraved and all that, but there's something, there's something badly wrong with a man that never gets saved that can be cured, and a man that comes to Christ, and a man that comes to Christ has something in him, the unsaved fellow that always rejects him doesn't have. Now, I know Calvin had some things to say about those things, but I don't believe everything I read in Calvin Institutes. And uh, you can't be honest and straight as an unsaved man without winding up getting saved. And you know what the Lord will do? And I've seen him do this a hundred times, if he's done it once. I've seen him take a fella and give him a little light here, a little light here, a little light here, a little light here, and the fella reject the light. No more light. And time goes by. Now, a little light here, the fella makes a move, a little light here, the fella makes a move, a little light here, a little light here, the fella rejects the light. No more light. 